How's that? Is that better? There it is. Uh, if you please open your Bibles to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. We're going to be looking at verses 33 through 41 this morning. Mark 15, verses 33 through 41. I'm going to go out on a limb here this morning and assume that you probably have no idea who Ernest Shackleton is. You'll be forgiven for not knowing that. But about 100 years ago, he was a fairly well-renowned explorer, and his kind of claim to fame, what he was trying to accomplish was he actually wanted to go across Antarctica and go and hit the, North, the South Pole and then do that. And he wanted to do it from one side, from the sea, go across to the, North, the South Pole, excuse me, and then go to the sea on the other side. And you have to understand, like, just getting there was difficult, but even the journey across, it was 1,800 miles across Antarctica, crossing the South Pole in the process of doing that. And he wanted to be the first person to be able to do that. And amazingly enough, people were, he had no trouble finding volunteers and people to kind of accompany him on this journey. Hundreds of people volunteered to come along with him. It would be uh, something they would probably regret for the rest of their lives. But they wanted to come along and be part of this epic journey, and so he did so. They set sail on the ship Endurance, and they moved steadily toward Antarctica. But in 19, January of 1915, they realized they were in trouble. You have to understand the you know, southern hemisphere, the seasons are flipped, so this is their summer down there, and they're making headway, but there's still plenty of ice and cold water that they're sailing through and moving through, and for whatever reason, as they're going through there, the ship became lodged in one of the ice floes, kind of frozen in place, and they began working and chipping at the ice and everything else that was there, blocking their way, and at one point, they got as close as 400 yards from open water, but by the end of February of 1915, they realized this is not going to happen we have to con kind of convert the idea of this ship from a ship into more of a, almost an ice shanty, so to speak, and spend the winter here. We're stuck here until the following spring, which would be September down there. And so that's exactly what they did. And the adventures just continued to, to continue there. And as they, they survived the winter, they got into the spring, and they were hoping that they would be freed from this ice flow that they were now stuck in and kind of moving as part of the ice flow across the, the sea down there. But as it, it started breaking up, and if you've seen things on the Black River, you've seen other places where the, when the ice starts to break up, it starts to pile. And that's exactly what happened against their ship. And all these, this ice started coming in and crushing against the, and the, the ship itself, and it cracked the three-foot-thick hull on this ship, and it sank. And so here they are on, uh, on an ice floe near Antarctica no, with no rescue, with no hope of doing it. If they survive, it's going to be up to them. And they continued to live on an ice flow in Antarctica or in that vicinity for the next several months. Finally, in April of 1916, they realized they, they had to do something because the ice flow they were living on broke. And so they had to get off of it. So they had three lifeboats between them. And they all got into the lifeboats, sailed, you know, rode, whatever, five days in icy waters and got to Elephant Island, which is an uninhabited island just north, I guess everything's north of there, but just north of Antarctica. And uh, so still not a great place to be, and uninhabited. And so here they are, and they're stuck again. And then first, as they arrived on Elephant Island, you have to understand, it was the first time that they had been on solid ground in 497 days. Between the ship and the ice flow, this is where they're at. And there is more to the story, but the worst part of the journey and the worst part of their time in this and before they finally were ultimately rescued was a surprising thing and something you would not expect. It was the darkness. Because you have to you understand when you're down that far south, the sun sets in mid-May and doesn't rise again until July. It's darkness. And you've probably seen this if you've been up in Canada or whatever. You've seen the, sometimes the extension of light that gets there. It's amazing. The, the sun doesn't really kind of set almost to 11, and it's back up at maybe 3 or 4 in the morning. It kind of makes it hard to sleep. But you also have the, the flip of that, and they had the reverse of that. And so the sun set, and thankfully they still had their ship. But you imagine, especially then with no electricity, uh, very limited uh, artificial means of light, that the sun set, and what do you do? It's not like they just pulled out their cell phones and entertained themselves, you know, playing solitaire for hours on end. I mean, they just you, just, you have darkness. You just have darkness. And even in climates that are not as extreme, that when that, that extreme aspect of that, that, uh, that night shifts into place, the suicide rates always go up. 
because the, the mental anguish and the depression begins setting in on people and they have a very hard time handling that. And that's kind of a universally recognized reality. And, and what we're looking at in our passage this morning here in Mark chapter 15, we find that Jesus is also experiencing some very real darkness and the mental anguish and the mental difficulties that were going on for him as a part of it. And it was nowhere near as long as what was going on. But of course, Jesus' surroundings and situations are also very, very different as well. But we look at this and we understand that this darkness was not explainable by normal means the way that the, the sailors' darkness was. This is clearly a supernatural event conveying something to Jesus, conveying something to everybody else that's around them, that they had been forsaken, that Jesus had been forsaken. And the reality is that we, we look at this and we realize Jesus was forsaken so that we wouldn't be. We're looking at the death of Christ, the final hours of Jesus' life, and, and what he willingly suffered for you. So we're going to look at the event of the crucifixion and also some of the witnesses of the crucifixion this morning. But understanding that the Son was forsaken so that those who trust him might gain access to the Father. Let's read now verses 33 through 39. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And we'll stop there. This is the events of the crucifixion, and we start very clearly with darkness. We know what happened. We don't know exactly know how it happened. People have tried to maybe put explanations of like, well, it must have been an eclipse, or it must have been this, that, or the other thing. None of those actually work. And it honestly doesn't matter how. We want to know why. Why the darkness? That's the only question that really matters. What is the significance of it? Now, as he says in here, it was the sixth hour, and their way of reckoning time was different than ours. So it's noon. It should be the brightest part of the day, and it suddenly just goes dark. And I don't think this is dark like what we have with an eclipse at various times or what we've seen in like a very stormy kind of a situation. It's amazing how eerie and dark it can get with just heavy cloud cover. I think that, like, this is darkness, like, like midnight darkness. It's reversed. That's going on, what they're experiencing right now. And we find darkness actually playing a role in Scripture in various places. The very first time we actually see darkness is actually in Genesis 1-2. It was part of God's creative act as God is creating the, the very elements that, that will become the world and everything else around it. One of the things that's there is darkness, and he creates the, the day to divide the light and the darkness. He, he creates those things, and he separates those things. And so the fact that there's a, the sense where night has kind of bled over into what should be the brightest part of the day kind of symbolizes an aspect of like God's absence, a sense in which God is almost like hands off, a sense in which God is suddenly maybe forsaken his creation, at least for a moment. It's symbolizing something. There's a sense of foreboding, maybe even judgment that's going on here. And I think we're meant to see that. But what comes next, and I think is even more important, fundamentally important for us here, is this aspect that comes from Egypt during the ten plagues. Specifically, if you look at Exodus uh, chapter 10, verse 22, we think about the ninth plague. It was a plague of darkness. And that was a darkness that settled down there on Egypt for three days. A darkness that was so dark it could be felt. What's important to note there is what comes next. The tenth plague is what they were just, Jesus has just celebrated with his disciples the day before. It was the Passover. The time in which the sacrificial lambs were sacrificed, the blood was put on the door so that when the death angel came by, you would see the blood, it would simply pass over that house because they believed, they valued the word of God that he had given to them and that he had told them. Jesus, we understand, is the Son of God. Jesus is the Lamb of God. You know, the Passover was always an either-or. Either your son will die as the death angel passes over, or a lamb will die in his place. Either a son or a lamb, one or the other. We realize that Jesus here is actually both. 
Jesus is the Son of God, and he is our sacrificial Passover lamb. So here we have the ninth and tenth plague all segueing together here. Three hours, not days, but three hours of darkness, followed by the slaughtering of a lamb so that the wrath of God might pass over all those who are in faith in Christ. We are meant to see that. We are meant to see that, and that is that darkness is coming, but it's, it's an act of judgment, too, against Christ. And, and it's, it's always been there. It was always a part of this. Amos 8, 9 through 10 actually talks about this as well, that this was all known long before. And I quote, On that day, declares the Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth in every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like the mourning for an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. That's that day. A day of judgment. A day of judgment against Christ for our sin. And so this is that forsaken, or excuse me, this darkness that we see. It's also an aspect of, of forsakenness. Three hours after the darkness had fallen on here, Christ cries out in Aramaic. Probably one of the two Aramaic phrases that you know. Of course, you know the first one, Abba, Father. And maybe this one, that Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the darkness that Christ is experiencing here that we're looking at right here is clear evidence that Jesus is forsaken at this moment. The phrase that Jesus uses there comes directly from Psalm chapter 22, verse 1. It's a verbatim quote. And it's certainly something that he feels right now. Jesus was forsaken so that we never would be. And you have to understand that it never happened before. For eternity, the Father and the Son had this eternal fellowship and relationship with each other. And then suddenly here, at this moment, for the first time before time, there's a separation. The Father is literally turning his back on his Son and looking away from him. Why? Because it's in these moments that all the sin of the world is piling up on Christ and he is dying on, on our behalf. And I think literally Christ is dying in the first and second death. We know, we're very familiar with what the first death is. Of course, it's this physical death. When we, we lay down, we go in the ground. But there's also that idea that second death we define that right in eternal separation from the Father. Granted, Christ is not going to be eternal, but he is being separated from his Father. He's being separated from his Father. He's being forsaken on our behalf. He's truly bearing our penalty for our sin. And that's how Jesus was able to take away all of our sins from us. He died paying for them so that we wouldn't have to. And all this is painfully necessary in order for you and I to have any hope of being with God. It reminds me a little bit of the statement that the high priest had made earlier when it came to Christ. Remember, they were fearing for the sake of the nation, fearing for their own power. And Caiaphas at that time made this statement. He didn't mean it quite this way, but he was exactly right. John 11.50 records it for us. He says, Nor do you understand that it is better for for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. And he's absolutely right. I would make one change, which is always dangerous to say when it comes to Scripture, but I would make one change. When he says nation, we realize now, looking back, we can put an S on the end, because it wasn't just for the Jews. It was for the Jews, but it's for us, for the nations, for the world, that Christ died, one man for the nations. It's absolutely true. It is better for us that one die for the sake of the nations. And that's exactly what Christ is doing here for us. He died for you and he died for me. And so many people have taken advantage of that, but so many more need to. They don't understand what it is that Christ has wrought for them and done for them. But yet Christ died and did this for you. And that brings us to this honestly confusing little section here on Elijah. And you're like, what? where is this coming from? And I think the only reason Mark left that that phrase untranslated was to give us some context. Where does Elijah come from? The Eloi and Eli sound similar. There's probably a correlation that's going on there at some level. That's not what it means. But I think the bystanders that were there that are probably actually mocking Jesus still at this moment in time are picking up on that. Kind of like like they intentionally misheard something that Jesus said. It's like, oh, he's calling for Elijah. 
Because, of course, that was, I think it's in Malachi, at the end of Malachi, it said that Elijah will come before the Messiah. Makes sense. Jesus has already told us that already happened. In John the Baptist, Elijah came in John the Baptist, so to speak. That's who that was. He announced his coming. He announced what was going to happen. He's already been here. But they're doing this because of the thing, look, Elijah will come. Because when Elijah was coming, he was supposed to help those who were in need. I wonder a little bit here if this isn't why they put that sponge on the end of that stick and held it up to Jesus, trying to preserve his life maybe a little bit longer to kind of mock him and see. Maybe, maybe Elijah will come and, and save you, bring you off this cross. I think that's why it's worded the way that it is. But that's where Elijah comes from and why he shows up in this. But all this is going on for their entertainment and Jesus' expense. See, God, Jesus is here forsaken not only by God, but also by all those that are immediately surrounding him. He's forsaken by all. That brings us to this next section here of access to the curtain. In that temple compound, there were actually two curtains as a part of the temple. There was a curtain on the very outside of the temple proper itself that separated the court of the, the women from the, the inner core, inner uh, aspect of the, the, the temple itself. And then there was a second curtain, a more elaborate curtain, that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place. And, and people differ on exactly which one of those curtains it was. But you think about the size of this. Herod's temple was 100 cubits high, about 172 feet. Now, it was probably on the outside. But still, the curtain on the inside was probably massive, perhaps over 100 feet tall. And it's torn from the top down. And if it's anything like the curtain that was elaborated in the Old Testament in the tabernacle, you can imagine what this fabric must have been like, not only to probably thick, because, I mean, it's, the very purpose is to obscure your view from inside, but it was embroidered. And so all those extra layers of, of thread and, and uh, intricacy and work would have made it that much more uh, strong, tougher to tear, and yet here it is, torn top to bottom, something that absolutely no human being could possibly do. You couldn't do it, especially from the top down, at the size of this thing. And yet here it is, torn. Now what's interesting here is the Bible never tells us why. It simply tells us it is. It is torn. Why? And there's a few viewpoints on this. They might also have an element of truth to them. Some just simply see it as a, an act of which God is saying in here like, that he is grieved. We see in Old Testament cases sometimes David did it, others did it, where they're grieving and they, they tear their clothes on the outside as this form of grief that people would see that and realize, oh, look at the grief that's going on there. It's possible. It's also possible that it's torn as a sign that God is enacting judgment, a sign of judgment against the religious uh, institution of Israel for their failure in recognizing who Jesus is and their desire to execute the Son of God. So it's kind of an act of judgment against them. Again, possible. But more popular, and I think maybe the more likely of these, is the idea that it's, it's the breaking down of the barrier that separates us and God. That there's now access being granted to those who are in Christ, that we can now go into the Holy of Holies, the place from where the presence of God actually was dwelling. And it seems to fit with what Hebrews 10 talks about as well. I think that's the most likely. But Mark never records Jesus saying, you know, there's various, the seven sayings of Jesus, and Mark never gives us the, it is finished one, but it's clearly there in John. And I think that's important to note as we think about this. It is finished. The curtain is torn. See, that curtain had always, by design, prevented people from having access to God. But it's gone now. The way's open. In other words, when, when Jesus died and you come to Christ, you have access. Here, what, it, what it's not is this, that when Jesus died, that you now have the ability to gain access, but don't actually have access. It, it would be something similar to this that you come to Christ, you accept him, and then a few days later in the mail, or during COVID, a couple months later in the mail, you, know, you receive your gift now, what you're supposed to do here. And it would almost be like getting like a, a pair of scissors or a knife. And so now you're in Christ, so now you've been given gifts and abilities to be able to do something, but it's still up to you to gain access to God. You have to do something. And so there's God, but there's still a barrier between yourself and God. And so here's your scissors. Start cutting. Start working your way through. Start doing this, and you realize it's going to be tough. You better get cracking. It's going to take you a lifetime. 
Start cutting on that curtain. Start trying to cut through that curtain. Gain access. You have a job to do. You have work to do. And there are many that believe it's that way, that, that in, when Christ died, he made the possibility for you to have access. So you gain an ability. You gain scissors in our illustration here. But you now have to get to work. You now have to do something. It's not just going to be giving it to you. So nobody's going to try and stop you. Like you're going to walk in there. Nobody's going to try and stop you or prevent you from going in there. But you have work to do. And the hard part of that is you never know when you get through. How long do you have to cut? How long do you have to work at this before you actually get access? The Bible never simply tells us, and, and they promote it. No, you have to work, and you have to do this, and you have to go here and think this way and work hard at all of these things. The Bible never says any of those things. The Bible says when Christ died, the curtain is torn, and he said, it is finished. There is nothing more to do. The curtain is torn. But so many people are coming right alongside Jesus, and they're standing before this torn curtain, and they're going right next to it and says, I'm not sure how we've got to get in there. And they start trying to gnaw away at this curtain, thinking they're going to get through. There's a gaping hole right here that Jesus has made for you. Now, I don't want to do that. I have to do something. And they're trying to attack this curtain and cut through this curtain. It's not the way that it's supposed to work. There's no work left to do. Those who come to Christ, who are in Christ, you realize that you are now saved, and you can properly say that and have the confidence that even three seconds after you come to Christ, that if you were to die, you would be welcomed into the presence of the Father, not because of anything that you have ever done, but because of what He has done for you already. It's done. It's finished. The curtain is open. The barriers that were preventing you from having access to God are gone. Christ did it. You never will. You can spend a thousand lifetimes trying to get through the curtain. It will never happen. Trust me. Many, many people have tried and tried and tried, and it doesn't work. And then and if you're working on that, you have no confidence in life, no confidence that God loves you, no confidence that you're being successful. So these are the events, at least that Mark records for us. But what are we to do with all this stuff? And that's what makes what comes next so important and, our, and, and, and the impact that it can have as an example for us to follow. So we're going to look here at the witnesses, the witnesses of the crucifixion. Let's read verses 39 um, through 41. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and Joseph, and of Salome. And when he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. The witnesses to the crucifixion. What we're finding here is the response of the centurion, probably one of the most well-known figures in all of Scripture. And I was, I was looking through this, and I'm like, what exactly did this guy see that made him confess this? Because you realize, like, hours before... He was as much against Christ as everybody else in that, in that praetorium, that area in which Jesus was condemned. He's there for a reason. He's there because he's in charge of the execution team that's been there to crucify all these guys. He's in charge of it. He's leading that charge. He's, he's, he's responsible for making sure they get up there and that they stay up there, that nobody brings them down. We know why he's there. But what does he see that so amazingly changes his attitude and mind towards Christ? It never really tells us. Jesus had said, though, that earlier when he was in Jerusalem, that if the signs that he had done there had been done in Tyre and Nineveh, they would have repented and believed long ago. There are plenty of Jews probably around this cross looking at all these same events. Want nothing to do with it. And here we have a foreigner, a Roman, looking at these very same things, and he confesses. In fact, he's the first person in the entire Gospel of Mark to confess, truly, this is the Son of God. That has never happened to anybody in the Gospel of Mark in their right mind. Demons possessed individuals had confessed Christ. You are the Christ. We know who you are. Nobody in their right mind until now has confessed Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. Nobody. And now finally he does. And as we're looking at the things that are going on that we've just read already, there's almost no way that, I mean, he's certainly looking at the sky. He hears Jesus talk about the forsakenness. There's almost impossible that he knows that the curtain in the temple has been torn. He's not there. It's almost impossible that he knows this. 
But Mark presents all this in an order and in a way that makes it seem as if he does. He's piled it all up. And I think that's on purpose because it's for you. It's for you. It's for me. Consider this. And ultimately, that's what the gospel has been doing the entire time. The gospel of Mark has been, has been presenting to us, is Jesus the Jewish Messiah or not? You have to make a decision here. Base, make a decision based on all the evidence that you've seen, and specifically the evidence that the centurion is witnessing right here. We have to realize, though, in this moment, that this centurion, this soldier, could see better in the darkness than anyone else around him. He's looking in the darkness at the Son of God, and he sees him for who he truly is. No one, even in the light, have been able to make and properly identify who Christ is. The soldier in the dark does. So who do you say that Jesus is? Is he the Messiah or not? Mark has written this gospel to a Roman audience to present Christ to them. They might see and know who Jesus is, but we also need to look at the same preponderance of evidence that Mark is offering to us and say, who do I believe that Jesus is? What do I have based on the evidence? Here's the evidence that he said, and, and, and the, the centurion is looking at the darkness. He's looking even above the sign above his head, the charges that are written against him, and he's like the king of the Jews. That's what he claimed. That's what they're saying about him. And he confesses. He comes to grips with this reality. This is true. Who do you say that Jesus is? If you're in Christ, we look at this crucifixion. It's a good reminder of what happened, and it should be a moment in which we look and say, you know what, I love to tell the old, old story and be reminded once again what it is that Christ has done for me. It's a good confirmation and affirmation of what it is that Christ has done for me. It's a pleasant thought, and it should be something that we enjoy thinking about. Christ loved me this much. God loved me this much that he sent his only son to die. But if you're not a believer, let me ask you, have you ever truly considered what the Bible says about Christ? And I mean really considered, not just like, I know what it says. Okay, facts and figures. Have you considered the truthfulness of it, the accuracy of it, and the implications of it? See, the Bible never leaves room to straddle the fence. And there are a lot of people in their skeptical viewpoints, their skeptical mind, that they just want to be a skeptic. They don't really want to believe anything. And so they kind of wind up straddling the fence all, all the time. They're not, they're not in this camp. They're not in this camp. They're just, they're just kind of undecided. And the question you have to ask for yourself is, do you want to remain undecided forever? Especially when it comes to something that for thousands of years, honestly, people have recognized as, one, as the most important eternal decision that you could possibly make. And people have recognized that aspect. This is the most important decision you can make in your lifetime. Do you really want to remain on the fence? Because there's no freedom there. You can't move. You can't do anything there. I've been coaching uh, uh, Lincoln's little baseball team in the last couple, couple weeks here. And, and one of the defining aspects, especially when you're playing baseball, is the fence, right? It's the fence. You wouldn't think that would be that big of a deal. But there's a lot of freedom in that. And, you know, if you're on the baseball field and you're in the, that fence line, it really it defines the field. It defines what's fair, what's foul. It defines, you know, where the bases are. It defines, like, if there's, is there a home run? Is there a grand slam happening? Does it keep the ball inside? Like, all of those things happen. But there's great freedom for the players when they're in the fence. There's also great freedom on the other side of the fence, on the outside for the fans. There's a lot of protections that a, a ball goes foul or, or is overthrown or something like that. There's a much better chance it's going to hit the fence and protect the fans. Obviously, it doesn't always happen, but you, you'd like to think it would. But the fans are able to move around in relative safety on the outside of the fence. There's freedom on both sides. There's not freedom when somebody is trying to straddle it. And on a team, especially when you're practicing on the field, they love throwing the balls over the fence, and they have to kind of jump over it, and they're kind of like half on, half off, and they, you, you're kind of stuck in that moment. You can't really move around. And the problem is there are so many people that are stuck and straddling on the fence and thinking, this is a great place to be. I'm st I got one leg on this side and one leg on this side. I'm kind of this skeptic, and I'm not really, really willing to commit to either way. You realize you're stuck and you have no freedom. There's freedom on this side of the fence. There's even freedom on this side of the fence. But since you're undecided, you can't do anything. You're undecided. This is not a position to have virtue in. This is not something to be held up to. 
I think it was C.S. Lewis that talked about the fact that, that skeptics like to be there. They like to see through everything. But he said the problem is the point of seeing through something is to see something on the other side of it. If you continually see through and then see through and then see through and then see through the next thing, he says, at the end of the day, you see nothing. Because there's never anything on, on the other side of it. You're constantly trying to remove everything. You want to get to the truth. You, you want to see through something, but the point of seeing through it is to see what's on the other side. To be able to truly examine the Word of God, the claims of Christ. Look at those things. If you want to see through them, go ahead. Try. And I'll tell you, many, many people, much smarter than I, have tried to do that very thing. And rather than see through them, they saw Christ. But please don't be content going through life and just say, you know, I've never really considered it, and I'm okay with that. That is not the place to be. There's no freedom to move around. There's no freedom to be able to do anything by straddling the fence. That is not a virtue. If anything, it's a vice. And it's keeping you from enjoying what Christ has for you. And I would encourage you and implore you, really, don't stay undecided. If you're unsure, that's fine. Ask your questions. But please ask those questions. Examine what it is that Christ has done. Examine the Word of God. Examine what others have read and written about Him. And come to a decision. But we move from the centurion now to the witness of the women. And these last two verses, even in our, in our Bibles, there's a paragraph marker there. They do feel like a tack on. And they offer to us something that I would call the worthless witness of the women. I worked hard on that. You're probably not very proud of me, but I worked hard on that. And, and, and I tell you, because it's actually very important. It's actually very important. And that's not me just making something up. The Talmud was actually the, this, this Jewish kind of guidebook that they would have followed really dis, was very dismissive on the value of, of, of women testimony, women witness. And so the, as the adage often goes, the only reason that Mark or really any of the gospel writers who put that in there is because it's actually happened. If you're trying to bolster your viewpoint and really try to prove a point, this is not how you start. Now, in our own day and age, we have no problem with the witness testimony of, of, of these ladies that are here, right? We, we look at this and like, okay, they saw it. Okay, that's good enough for me. Not a problem. That's not how they would have seen it in that day and age. But it is how we can see it in this day and age. But it also is encouraging to us because we see that it's there and Mark puts it there on reason because that's the way that it happened. That's the only reason why he would do that. And we see them as this witness. And though they're keeping their distance, the Bible's actually holding them out as examples and saying, and be like them. Now, there's, there's maybe a slight rebuke. It depends on how you want to take it. Like, they kept their distance. They're not right there. They kept their distance. At the same time, they're held up and saying, you want to follow Christ? Here, look to these women who are there. Because where are the disciples? We have no idea. They're not here. And what's amazing about these women is they're not just here. They're at the crucifixion. We also find them at Jesus' burial. They're looking to go to where Jesus is because they want to make sure that he receives a proper burial. Again, very, very risky for many, many reasons. They're also the first ones that are there at Jesus' resurrection. They're at the most important events of Jesus' entire ministry and career. The women are there. Men, nowhere to be found. They're held up as an example. You want to follow Christ, be like this. Be bold and confident. And it's amazing that these women did that, especially in a day and age in which they had less rights and less protections, were much more vulnerable in the things that they were doing, and they didn't care. We will follow Christ regardless of the cost. I think the bias against women is even factored in here because Mark never records for us anything that they say here. It's silent. And yet their actions speak far louder than their words because they're there and they're stronger and they're braver than any of the men. This is how they did it. As far as who they are, we don't know a lot about most of them. Luke chapter 8 verse 10, uh, 2 tells us that Mary Magdalene actually had been possessed by seven demons that Jesus had cast them out, freed her from that. And she'd been a faithful follower ever since. Mary, uh, the mother of James, it's perhaps James the son of Alphaeus. I'm not 100% sure on that. Salome also is another question mark, but she's believed to be the mother of the sons of Zebedee, so James and John. And then, of course, there's some other ones that are there also, just not simply named. But all of these individuals were faithful followers of Jesus all the way to the end. 
They're witnesses. You can go talk to them. But they're also examples following Jesus. Even when they had no idea what was going on and it looked like all was lost, they're still there. Follow Christ. <clears throat> Honestly, going back to our original story, for Ernest Shackleton, in order to save his men, he realized he had to forsake them. When they finally got to that Elephant Island, he realized they couldn't stay there either, and so he got in one of those lifeboats, traveled 700 miles across open ocean to get to an island that had a whaling camp on it. When he arrived there, he actually arrived on the wrong side of the island, and rather than get back in the boat and try to navigate around, they decided to go up and across the island, probably were tired of the water, but it was actually a very mountainous uh, stretch, and they had a 50-foot length of rope and a carpenter's adze, that's all they had to make this very treacherous, mountainous kind of journey. Just crazy things that were going on that they experienced. But they finally got to this whaling camp, rested for a couple of days, and were back on the water in a much bigger ship, trying to rescue the remaining crew on Elephant Island. It took him four attempts and four months to finally get back there, but eventually they did, saving all 22 remaining crew. But you have to understand, to be able to do that, he had to get in a boat and he had to forsake them. He had to leave them. And, and we realize what Christ did for us. Christ, in order to save us, he had to be forsaken. I know that's not a one-for-one one as far as the illustration goes, but you understand the forsakenness aspect, that God forsook his Son that we might be saved. That's a huge cost. And it's a cost that I don't think we can appreciate. Just like we can't appreciate being on, on a, an ice flow for months in darkness. We cannot appreciate it, but it doesn't take away from the significance of what was going on here. And now we wait. We wait for his return because he promises to take every one of us who are in him, who are trusting him and him alone for salvation, he promises to take us home. But if Jesus had never been forsaken, you and I would have no hope. Just like those sailors, if they had not been forsaken by Ernest, they would have no hope. And yet he forsook them and brought hope to them. Christ has been forsaken for us so that those who trust in him can have access to the Father. And I would implore you and I would beg you, if you are not sure of where you stand before Christ, talk to me. Ask someone. At least read your Bible and explore what the claims that Mark is, is making here. What does this mean? Who is Christ? That you might appreciate and understand what it is that he has done for you. The Bible simply says, call on the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. I think that's exactly what the centurion did. And it's what all of us who are in Christ have simply did too. Call on his name and be saved. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and the story, the very real story of the crucifixion. And Lord, why you willingly laid down your life for us. Lord, as we really get down to it and we understand the, all the bits and pieces that come together for that, we realize how, how much suffering you truly did enter into to pay our debt. And that, Lord, it was truly paid. It's not being ignored or passed over, looked over. It was paid. And that we can simply have this. It's for the taking. It's for the asking. And yet, Lord, how many people try and spend a lifetime trying to work to gain what has simply been given? And yet, Lord, you will not share your glory with anyone. To try to earn what has been given is to cheapen. And so, Lord, you hold it out as a free offer. Lord, I pray that if there is anyone in this room that does not know you as their Savior, that you would stir deeply within their hearts, convicting them and challenging them to explore the claims of Christ. And that they might be assured of who they are, really who you are. And make the changes. Call on your name. Please, Lord, give them the strength, and the stamina, and the burden to do these things. For those who are, Lord, I rejoice. And I pray that all of us might go from this place rejoicing when we think about what it is that you have done for us. 
that it truly does give us a reason to get up in the morning to praise your great name, that it would inspire our praise, inspire and give us confidence day in and day out. This is my God, and he has died for me. And to serve you faithfully and boldly for as long as we shall live. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.